So hi everyone, welcome to this month's edition of Be Life. Um, I'm joined by an amazing panel of guests. Um, and before we start, I'd just like everybody to know that we are going to be talking about quite sensitive matters today. Um, so we're going to be looking at maternal health and black women, um, and there may be quite some stories which may be quite traumatic um, or may trigger some people. So um, 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 my colleague, um, um, my my colleague, um, yeah, I think we've got some. Sorry. Yeah, so my colleague Alex will be putting some links in the chat where people can get support. So the organisations that we've um, chosen that can support people are Black Mums Matter Two, um, Five Times More, the Motherhood Group, and um, 4mmm.org. So um, Alex is going to be putting those links in there. So yeah, as I've mentioned, the stories that we're going to talk about, be talking about maybe a bit traumatic um, as they, they may include um, things about child child loss, um, miscarriage and other sensitive matters. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. So let me get the, to the panel to introduce themselves. So first I'll get my friend Nichelle to introduce herself. Hi, my name's Nichelle and I'm a midwife at one of the London NHS Trusts. Oh, thank you. Um, and Rebecca? <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca and I work for a charity called um, Positively UK. Uh, it's an HIV charity and I also um, co-direct the 4M Mentor Mothers Network CAC. And Kemi. Hi everybody, I'm also a midwife and working in London's hospitals. Um, I'm also a health visitor and I am, have my own private services that offer for midwifery care for parents under the professional auntie service. Thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, the main statistic we're going to be looking at is one of the statistics from the Embrace report. And it had it, it quoted that um, black women are now four times more likely to die in pregnancy or childbirth. This is a slight improvement from the previous statistics of five times more likely. Um, but this is question is mainly for um, Nichelle and um, Kemi. And it's how aware of, of these statistics do you feel like professionals are? Um, Nichelle, you can start. I think we're definitely aware of the statistics, especially with all of the recent, um, it's in the media, you see it on TV, um, there's loads and loads of Facebook groups popping up at the moment, Instagram, the way that we use social media, there's a lot of people um, that like, the general public may not have known. I feel like it's something that in in the hospital in midwifery, we probably re we knew about disparities already. It's just come to the forefront. So now we're getting members of the public that are saying, well, actually, um, this isn't right. What's going on? What are we doing more about it? And it's actually just come to more of the forefront of everyone's mind. So yeah, that's that's where it's that's where it's at currently. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Yeah, I would say yeah. that how it's not we're not ignorant to what's going on in the news. Obviously, as professionals, we also have to keep ourselves updated what's going on and service. And I feel like even there's things that there's a plan, long term plan put in place to um, obviously to reduce that number. We want to and obviously looking at each point and things that services can improve. I feel like um, Michelle can obviously testify there's a lot of continuity. Um, maternity services being offered. So within then they're trying to think about um, diabetes and midwives, um, continuity of care midwives. So there've been a lot of, um, so they have like little niches or kind of services we're offering to certain conditions. Um, so that we're making sure that how they they see a team and we know continuity plays a big part in reducing these numbers, you know, having known a professional. So I think there's a lot of work being done within each trust to make sure they do have more midwives that are more targeted for certain people that they see a team in their pregnancy during labour and also um, postpartum as well. And these things obviously are something that I think will hopefully aim to improve these things, but we're not ignorant of what's going on. And obviously no one wants these numbers to be as high as it, it has been. Definitely. I think it was really important what you when you uh, mentioned the continuum of care, because I feel like a lot of, like I've got a five-year-old, so I've, you know, I've gone through the like, maternity service and I feel like when I, went through the services I had a different midwife every week I did not see the same person more than once and I feel like sometimes you get tired of explaining the same thing over and over again to different people but I feel like when you have the same midwife you create a bond you create a relationship she knows you or they know you you know them you know you can you can build that kind of rapport I know you um Rebecca, you work with a lot of uh, of women who are living with HIV and you know you work on the peer you know the peer mentoring scheme as well 
in terms of the NHS, how much do you feel like we have, how much trust do you feel like we, has, we have as a community in the healthcare system or in the NHS in general? Um, honestly, I think coming, you mean in, in terms of black people, um, I think the trust is probably as much as we trust the police force, not very much. And it's really sad to say, especially since we have such a great, you know, system in place. Um, but again, this is falling back on all of the other things that we, you know, very often black people don't feel heard. Um, they get dismissed, uh, you know, and representation uh, as they, as, as you go higher up in the NHS is not very often similar to what we're, we're, we're familiar with. So that all of those things tend to make people very, um, you know, skeptical, fearful. I mean, COVID era has been a really very, uh, been a very good example in terms of rolling out the, the vaccines. Again, it's the Black African community or the Black community that's a lot more skeptical, uh, skeptical about receiving these vaccines. So um, in terms of trust, I think there isn't very much and we need to do a lot more work in terms of gaining that trust again. Yeah. No, definitely. I think, Nichelle, what stuck out when I first spoke to you is um, you told you, you mentioned to me about your your experiences that led you to become a midwife. Would you mind sharing a bit more about that? So um, 10 years ago, I had my first daughter. Um, and for whatever reasons I was led to be, I had to have a C-section. Now, irrespective of if I'd been given the choice and given all the information, whether I'd had it or not at the time, um, looking back now, I am a midwife afterwards actually I was spoken to a lot about the risks of things I was told I had to have a c-section in the morning um you know I wasn't really listened to but actually I wasn't really I wasn't given the opportunity to ask any questions it was this is what we're doing this is the reasons why you're doing it sign here on the line we'll see you in the morning things were seen to me as like an emergency but then they left me to the morning to have the cesarean section um that after a little while that led me to thinking, do you know what, I want to be a midwife, I want to be the change, I want to make women feel like they're going to be listened to. Um, and then uh, last year in March, um, during a pandemic, I had a beautiful hypnobirth VBAC, which is a, a vaginal birth after cesarean section. And it was really, really healing for me because I, although my cesarean section wasn't traumatic, it was very traumatic for me and their recovery and being able to process um, what had happened um it took quite a few years um if i'm being quite honest so yeah so i wanted to be that change and i wanted to be that voice um and that's what i'm trying to do <laughs> no fantastic no I, I totally agree in terms of um seeing more faces similar to us in um in, in in those environments like i i literally just had a conversation today with my auntie and she was explaining to me how she had her last child i think it was maybe 15 years ago and um being a, a an immigrant from africa her experience of having a child in africa was totally different to an experience of having a child here and she was explaining she had a c-section and she was offered um a general anesthetic and she said she was not offered an epidural she was not offered any other pain relief and it's just when a nigerian midwife happened to walk past and saw her in so much pain she said to her oh there's gas and air in here oh there's these options but she was never ever given you know that information and it's scary to think that even though this was 15 years ago people mm. still having similar experiences in 2021 yeah. you know what i mean it's yeah. scary Kemi, do you have anything else to add about the the trust that we have with the nhs i think like nothing spreads more within the black community than word of mouth first of all so i think the biggest thing amongst black people is when you have a bad experience you spread you know so some people someone's got a bad experience the trust has been gone from people like yourself you know, myself even as a midwife I had I didn't have a great experience myself um and it was I wasn't listened to I could have had my baby in a water birth or something like this before but because I wasn't listened to that I was dilating because of my first pregnancy even though I was a midwife and my mom was like she's a midwife but I didn't want to be you know over, you know these things like okay maybe I wasn't but I went from zero I progressed you know very quickly in my labor and I was told you can't be, you were zero centimeters. So I was taken to the antenatal ward, even though they want me to go home. And I said, no, I was gone, I want to stay. And the only reason they let me stay because obviously they said, okay, she's a midwife, let's see. Within an hour, I had my son. And I wanted a water birth. So these are things, like sometimes it doesn't, some people think, oh, you, you, it's just not being listened to. That aspect of not being listened to. And knowing, even when you know things, you have to really advocate for yourself. So I think trust within, um, 
our community is when we haven't had the good experiences, um, we really do have like a trust because we've been like, I did try this, they didn't listen to me, and I'm now I'm gonna have to put up, do more to make sure I'm heard. So, and like that, these are the reasons why myself and like within our people are coming into this role or even really trying to speak up for ourselves to make sure that we are heard and that there are experiences within the NHS services, within our community to change that so that trust does improve. Yeah, no, totally, I totally agree. When I was researching for this topic, I read a study um, from America and they'd asked, I think they were medical students. Um, so this was from the University of Virginia in 2016. And some of the stereotypes um, that had come from these conversations. So they asked um, medical students about, so they gave them scenarios. So they gave scenarios with sort of like a black person and a white person. And they had beliefs from the, the study, they found that they had beliefs that black people experienced pain differently from white yeah. people, which yeah. we absolutely yeah. it's, you know what I mean, it's bizarre to think about these things in this day and age. Do you feel like this has an impact on, on people's experiences in healthcare now? A thousand percent. <laughs> like <laughs> as a mid like it's really, really difficult, but you have to call it out. That's the only way that on the shop floor that we're gonna move forward. So you hear that, look at her, the big childbearing hips. That's one that you'll hear probably at, in your own house. Like we all, we've all heard it in and around. Actually, what you look like on the outside has nothing to do with how you're going to birth your baby. Nothing at all. Um, you know, oh my God, look at you, are so big and strong. You don't need to have that epidural. Being big, strong, short, tall has no bearing on us withholding pain relief from our women. Um, so yeah, it's just calling it out with, with colleagues or, you know, you're hearing something that's not quite right. It's just saying why you think it doesn't have to be confrontational, but it's to get people and everybody else thinking like how I'm thinking or how I'm trying to think um, and say, well, why are you saying that? And it makes them think, hold on, why am uh Yeah, yeah, it's about calling out those types of things. Um, but yeah, we, we, we hear, I hear it. I hear it quite a lot. It's my bugbear. <laughs> that, yeah, we're stronger. Um, you know, um, just because of the colour of our skin, um, we should be able to take the pain. You know, I've heard all, I've heard it all. Yeah, it's quite frustrating, but. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Rebecca, I saw you nodding your head a bit there. I'm guessing you've maybe come across such things. Um, quite a lot. And, and, and it's really, you know, it just, it just adds to what we were talking about earlier about the mistrust it just adds to that all the time and um, women come away with really bad experiences and you know um i've heard that i've read somewhere actually as well that the assumption is we have thicker skin or therefore our, our nerve endings um are slight are not as sensitive and you're and you're thinking where where do they get these assumptions you know i mean underneath the skin color it's the same same sort of anatomy so it makes you wonder you know uh, particularly if it's within healthcare professionals because you're wondering what you're learning the same the same thing as as niche niche sorry or or you know chemi so why is it different and it is it's really frustrating no definitely Kemi I'm guessing you've you've everyone nodded when I asked this question everyone yeah. Asked this, so yeah, yeah. And, and definitely going to give niche here because we've that the funny I laugh because obviously the childbearing hips is the common thing you have on the shop floor or you know mm -hmm. and how someone looks and um, but it's sad because they'll tell you stud there's actually studies that will tell they will say the studies that show you them this I'm like there's no studies that say you know this is what they're going to be and it's funny enough, I feel like, especially not to say um, the older generation of midwives, even within the black community, have been so ingrated with what they've been having, like a, like a, like a social um, consensus of certain things. Even like me said, you have to call out even our black counterparts on certain beliefs they have. And so um, as we're saying this, it's like what, how we're treated is also treated by our own um, counterparts ourselves how they even see ourselves so even that narrative within ourselves and our own community and changing especially with older generations you know obviously we know more when you come in and you're not saying all but i'm saying sometimes we have to change the generation change the culture because even some of them are coming with their own cultural beliefs into the actual um care we give and that can't be how we treat people and something like that where you're stronger you're the pain don't you know don't you don't need to shout that's a big one you don't need to shout yeah. oh that's how she's her pain 
So if she wants to shout, save India. And I feel like that's, that takes away from that woman at a moment in time. If that's how she wants to express her pain or obviously and, and offer her support in that time, I don't think no one should be telling anyone that you don't, you don't need to shout. She's not, she's, she's over-exaggerating her pain, <laughs> you know, and letting people think that her because she's a black person or ethnic minority that she basically, she'll do the pain better. Mm. And these are all things I feel like how within our community as well. Yes, um, there, but I feel like sometimes we have to call out, like you said, things that we know of that how and challenge our colleagues when we see certain practices or certain things being said of her why what proof do you have about this why are you saying that you know and what are we offering her no definitely I think when you said the bit about people being told to quiet down I remember being in labor and I think I screamed so loud the whole room went quiet and they all looked <laughs> to say like why are you making so much noise and I'm thinking if you could only know how much pain I'm feeling right now and I remember I'd always said I wanted an epidural but they tried everything to get me against the epidural and I'm like I know what I'm like with pain like I know so this gas in there is not even touching the sides the pills that you're giving me is not even touching the sides none of it is touching the sides so please just you know listen to me like when you mentioned a bit about not being heard I really felt that at some stages I felt like and I feel like sometimes it's, as you said, it's not even necessarily a race thing. Sometimes I've had black midwives who've been like, oh, you're African, you're strong. You know, your mother did it with no, uh, with no bejewel. You should do it. I'm like, I'm not my mum. I'm not my mum. Like, that's <laughs> No, and even, and even if you are a mum, who's to say that mum didn't feel the pain that yeah. she was at the time and it wasn't recognised? Right. You know, it's that. You to, who, who are you to say that though? Pain is pain. And we all have different levels of, you know, so yeah. I think the main thing in all of this is just to listen to people like, and I feel like sometimes you're maybe not in a position to, you're so battered, you know, sometimes you're, you're trying to talk, but your voice is not being heard. And I feel like there's, a, there's a question I've got later about advocacy, but it's really important to have somebody who can advocate for you. Um, yeah. But we do have Mars Lord um, joining us just now. She's um, an experienced doula. Um, I think Alex is just going to let her in now. So, hi, Mars. Welcome. Hi. Forgive me. I was busy doing something and I went, there was something this afternoon. <laughs> it's okay, Mars. Mars. Yeah, so I was just asking um, the ladies a question um, about the, the US study. I'm not, not sure if you've heard of it, about um, Black people experiencing pain, supposedly Black people experiencing pain differently. Um, to their white counterparts or to other other groups. Oh, yes, because uh, within the same. Oh no, they did a study amongst medical students where the medical students. Um, oh, I've forgotten the percentages where the medical students said that yes, um, black people were much better at at pain, had higher pain levels, so therefore didn't need the same amount of analgesia. They also had a study that showed that, oh, in fact, God, this is, I also have a, a UK anecdote, but they also showed in the study that black babies do better when they're treated by black doctors because white doctors think that black babies, like black adults and black children, don't um, feel pain in the same way. And it was about three, four weeks ago, a comment dropped into my DMs because people are always sending me these things. And it was a nurse who was told that black babies didn't need analgesia because they're strong. That's in 2021 in the UK. So we don't have the UK studies because we don't look for that, because if we look for that, we have to admit that this shit goes on. So we spend a lot of time looking at the US studies and saying, well, God, America's awful. That doesn't happen over here, but it clearly does. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you for that, Mars. Um, sorry, before we go any further, I totally forget to, to, to get Mars to introduce herself. Um, oh. <laughs> so, so I'm Mars, the late one. Um, and I am a coach, a doula educator, a birth activist. And um, what's it that she says? I'm a disruptor. I'm a health disruptor. <laughs> we love to and, see. 
<laughs> and I'm called Mars not because I'm like the chocolate. There's very little sweet about me, particularly when it comes to these subjects. Um, I'm more like the planet or the god of war. And I'm quite happy to accept the title of angry black woman because the way black women, black people's health is treated, the way that we're treated through the maternity system, etc., is is no look. It's no longer a crisis, it's a scandal. It's been a, a crisis in crisis for years. It's a scandal that it's still in crisis and that our own government, Nadine Dor is at, at the end of the debate about the petition for black maternal health said, yeah, we just can't identify where any targets should be. So we're not gonna set any. That is that is absolutely kind of yeah so that's who i am a mother of five none to two one biological one co-opted and you, i have two i don't care what anyone says and um what else can i tell you about me no i think that's pretty much it i love a good steak and red wine i'll never be vegan sorry <laughs> not sorry <laughs> Thank you, Mars. I just had a quick question. I was ex I was ex I was talking to um, my mum today, and I was telling her we've got a doula, we've got some midwives, and we've got um, we've other people on the panel as well. And she asked me what's a doula, and I couldn't give her a, an accurate description of what a doula does. In short, a birth doula is a professional birth companion, someone that walks with you and, and the family through pregnancy. You go into labour; they're with you through labour. They're with you at the birth. And they're there to help you just afterwards. A postnatal postpartum doula is, I like to say, in fact, I think it works with both really, is your mother without the politics. They're there to make sure that you're nourished, you're cared for, you're fed, you're watered, that you know what you're doing with the baby. A lot of people think that a postnatal doula is a cleaner, a walker of pets. I mean, some will, but oh, um, a walker of pets. Uh, someone who will just do lots of jobs and chores for you. But when I train doulas, I train them to nurture and nourish the parent, to be that listening ear, to sit with them, to hold them, to give them the space. Sometimes, yeah, you're going to wipe down the surface or, you know, load a, a washing machine or something. But that's not what we're there for. But mm. that's just something that we might do. But I tell everyone I don't iron and I don't walk creatures, so... <laughs> But um, so, yeah, so that's I think that's pretty much what we are. And we in the years gone by, we were the wise women of the village. We were the one that came when you were birthing. We're the ones that came when um, you just had a baby. The spiritual songs, the feeding, the watering, the caring for the holding together, you know. And when you have your babies, we're not there to say, oh, God, you mustn't do it that way. We're there to help you listen to your instinctual self because the world is constantly telling us how we should do these things. And we're like, that's not what I want to do with my baby. But if I don't do that, I'm a bad parent and I'll be judged by everyone. And anyway, her next door, her baby does this, this and this and my baby doesn't. So therefore, I'm a dreadful parent because I can't manage to raise a baby because we're too busy reading books and sort of outsourcing our parental instincts so what your doula does is your doula is there to say okay let's use your brains what are the benefits of this action what are the risks what are the alternatives what does your instinct tell you what if you do nothing what does the science say and when it comes to the birth in fact even postnatally, you also need to use your heart and you can use your heart with anyone. I hear what it is that you're saying and I empathize with that, but I'm just gonna assert and affirm my choices and my decisions. But I'm gonna reassure you that if anything changes, I'll bring this discussion back to the table. Thank you for your time. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Mars. That was a really interesting description of what you do. So it might, yeah. I now feel more confident moving forward when somebody asks me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, when we're looking at the statistics that we, we, we mentioned briefly before, um, the statistics of uh, black women being more likely to die in pregnancy and labour, 
I mean, I hear it quite often argued that, you know, it's because of uh, socioeconomic factors, medical history, as in to the reason why statistics are these way. But I've looked at cases like Serena Williams, who had issues, um, Beyonce had issues. Um, and I mean, medically, they said they were fit and healthy and they had no underlying issues. Um, and also, you know, Tatiana Ali, she was in... Um, Fresh Prince. Tabele. And the reason and she was a singer. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the reason why she stuck out to me is because she said her first pregnant, her first labour wasn't very positive, but she uh, enlisted the help of a doula for the second uh, pregnancy. She said she had a much better experience. So basically, my question is: if even these rich, famous, wealthy celebrities are having issues um, in in terms of you know medical care and issues during a, a labour, what do you think this means about healthcare in general? Um, we can start with um, uh, Kemi, sorry. Um, I think a lot of the factors regarding some of the reports of here, how there is a narrative, there is a perspective, there is a way black women are viewed. We can't fight that. And that's ongoing. So even if you are such a, whatever your class may be, they have a view about you. Um, and I feel like sometimes that not being heard or being able to speak up for themselves or being heard and advocate for themselves is also a key thing. So where someone has said that basically they've had like a doula or someone that they would advocate for themselves on what the right questions it is to ask in a healthcare environment. And, that, and I feel like sometimes the difference, which I think maybe we'll, we'll go on to say is that we, within ourselves as in our black community is asking the right questions or being feeling empowered to say, no, I don't want to. I feel like there is a, uh, something amongst us that we feel we can't say no. And I think that's back, up, back to the education that we, we don't need to have about our own health and also about what, that this is our body. We can decline anything, you know? And I think that's the empowerment. I feel like going forward, we need to give women that how asking the right questions, why are you doing this? What is the reason behind this? Do I have an alternative? You do. <laughs> you always have an alternative. Um, you know, you can say no. Can I? You know, and I think that empowerment for within the black community and black women knowing that they have rights and not that how they are they're told what to do and they have to just go along with it. And I think that narrative within all things, sometimes the lack of education of understanding, because a lot of women come into pregnancy and have no idea about what's going to happen in their pregnancy journey. That in itself is concerning to me. I feel like we learn trigonometry in school, never going to use it. <laughs> never ever but you know um but this these key things about women in ourselves about our whole journey i think we really need it's something that's been taught about you know your birth pregnancy you know these things i feel like are key fundamental life skills about yourself that a lot of women go by what their families told them and they think this you know and not real life what's happening and these things are factors that basically how do you advocate for yourself if you don't know what to ask if you don't know what to expect so how does a, a woman advocate for herself if she has no education on what to expect or what to see She's trusting this person in front of her of what they're telling her. And these are things where the starting point where my thing goes wrong. So I feel like even a star, she has no idea. She's not got the right support. Doesn't matter, I'm a black woman. And, and they've really perceived you a certain way. Oh, Serena, she's got good hips, good fire, baby's coming out right. She's not going to be fine. She's strong. Beyonce is strong. She's been through this, you know, she sings survival, you know, all these songs, you know, they're ready, they're good. So these are perceptions they have of them already, no matter what. And will she complain? You know, in the black community, sometimes we, we don't complain. Even when we have bad experiences, we just tell our friends it was bad, but we don't complain. Mm. Because we don't want that narrative of the angry black woman. Let's yeah. not upset them. And actually, if they're already, this healthcare profession has got this narrative in their brain already that, okay, you're going to be stronger and you're not saying anything, or you do go to say something, you've been quiet your whole labour and then you go to say something and then we go, oh, well, no, you know, they'll dismiss it. They might be dismissive of you. And then that's when things go wrong because these women are feeling a certain way and they're not able to voice that or the healthcare profession is not listening. So it's a bit of both. And it ends in adverse outcomes because the best person to tell me about their birth, about what's happening to their body, is that woman, regardless of the healthcare professional, the doctors with the scanning machines and all the kits and everything, mm. it, it, it's the women and they're not listened to. That, that's, that's what you hear, I'm not listened to, or I wasn't, I wasn't given the information in a clear way, or uh, my favorite, I wasn't allowed. I was allowed. Absolutely mm. correct. You know, oh, and you always, as a midwife, as soon as I say, they say, what do you do? I go, a midwife, they go, oh, I've got a story. Everyone, everybody tells me their birth story is good or bad, everybody. And 
generally the bad ones are always the ones that are going to floor me and they give me all the information and then they expect me to I don't know maybe help them or tell them what went wrong and I'm just like oh and they told me I wasn't allowed and I'm like you know from there you can't I can't really go anywhere so I totally agree with um Kemi in terms of educating ourselves um other than what your mum told you other than what just your auntie told you and not Ha and sitting down and having these conversations with the women in your family, not as a throwaway comment. Oh yeah, I had few other kids. I never had no epidural. That's not a conversation. That's a comment, and that's going to impact on that birthing mm. person. It's about sitting down and having proper open conversations. So in your birth, what happened? Da -da 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 -da, asking questions and going from that, that whole oh, it's a village. That that is what we need to go back to. That is definitely um um that I think that's where. The education is lacking um, and that's not to put the onus on the birth in person um, I just think that even now it's great as I said the power of social media we've got all these lovely groups coming together where you've got you know black empowerment and five more times more likely and I've got a couple of friends that have put together these birth, black birth professionals to see how we can do things on the ground um, and I think that's definitely a good thing um but anybody that's listening definitely advocate for yourself educate yourself um birthing classes um just yeah lots and lots of reading to try and make sure that you're you're in the best position possible you almost need to be careful with birthing classes though because the birthing classes tend to be run with the materials that show the rosy cheeked white baby etc i'm not saying we shouldn't go to birthing classes but we need to be aware of what they come but what I wanted to say was it's really important that we have this discussion within our families etc but it's we need to remember where that narrative has come from where they tell us to just hush to behave etc and that was because we needed to stay safe otherwise Massa was gone beat us we needed to keep our heads down so that we didn't get murdered and killed I was going to say that doesn't happen anymore. I really wish I could. But as we come forward, this is where we have the responsibility to break the cycle and say, actually, it's OK to talk about it. So I was I was um, with um, my family, uh, my sisters and some other other black women. And someone was talking about what I do. And I was I started talking about placentas. <gasps> oh my God, you can't talk about that. That's just, oh, nobody here needs to hear about that. People don't need, and I'm like, every single one of you, but one has given birth to a child. <laughs> if you have been big enough and ugly enough to have a penis inside you and all of the fluids that come with that, how can you not talk about a placenta or the fluids of birth? It's just, a placenta that nourishes and grows your baby so we don't have and you're right we don't have the conversations with our our families and our families they just do as you're told because we believe in dr god and under dr god is mid is midwife god but midwife god isn't quite as strong as dr god right so we say just your midwife knows they are the expert it's like in what yeah they're the expert in midwifery but you're the expert in you and your body. Mm. And one of the reasons why we are at disproportionate risk, and I know that I missed the earlier question about the slight improvement of the figures. Let's just clear that up. That was a reclassification of race. That wasn't a lowering of the stats amongst black people. That was a reclassification of race. And I think, uh, plus those figures are three years old, they're not current. So the next Embrace report comes out in November 1st, 2022. So next year. So we'll have a little look and see where those figures are, especially with COVID in the mix. Though COVID won't quite make that report, I don't think, because they're three years behind. Anyway, we tell people they need to speak up, but they can't speak up because there's nobody that's listening or hearing, which is why I have an issue with some of the birthing classes. No, that just happens to all women. No, that kind of experience won't happen to you. We need to talk to our families. We need our families to be having the conversation so that we can break the cycle so that the ones that come after us 
know what to do. And my last family story, and this is my son, went, my eldest son, he's 28 now, when he was 13, he was at an all boys school. And the, the teacher said, and this is how birth works. And my son said, I'm really sorry, sir, but birth doesn't work like that. Okay, Lord, if you know how birth works, why don't you tell the class? And he said, mum, I got through the birth, the placenta and the golden hour and I was halfway through breastfeeding when I thought I should stop. <laughs> because I'm not afraid to talk about the gubbings with my children, the fluids that come. And when my first grandbaby was born, he was born in a pool in my house. And my daughter, as she was giving birth to him, as she went through labor with him, she trusted her body to do what it was gonna do. Her midwife uh, didn't bring the gas and air because she says, I just leave that. And if they call for it, then I'll go and get it. She said, but if I put it in front of them, they want it. But my daughter has spent, oh, 16 years of her life learning about birth and trusting her body. So it didn't occur to her to ask me. That's what she said, wait, where is the gas and air? <laughs> and I said, did you need it? No, but I just realized that I didn't have it. So we need to be telling the stories to one another about how birth works. And I think the reason people pour out their bad birth stories is because they've never had anyone to listen and hear. And I spend time as a doula debriefing the grandmothers. So I've been to the birth, I've debriefed with the mother or the parent, and then the grandparent comes and says, oh, this happened to me. And what we're seeing is shocking behavior. So we've got the fantastic midwives and I really think we need to raise those up. When we find the fantastic ones, we need to talk <laughs> about them. But man, there are some shocking ones and we need to talk about their practice too. So they don't listen to you and you're right because we don't wanna be seen as the angry one. Our partners don't want to be the one that's told to be quiet or I'm calling security because you're being there. Some say that stuff doesn't happen. Okay, let's deny my 16, 17 years doing this work and what I see and what people share and tell me. And so we say you have to advocate for yourself, but how do you advocate your, for yourself in a system when no one is willing to hear you? And what we need to change isn't what black women and black birthing people are doing. We need to change the system that they're in. And that doesn't happen overnight. And when we talk about it, people get all up in themselves. You're calling me racist. So now I just start saying to people, that's anti-black behavior. <laughs> when you say racism, that's racism. They, you're calling me racist. When you say that's anti-black behavior, they go, oh. So my friend has got me on a mission to tell everyone to say anti-black instead of racist. But yeah, so. Th those are my thoughts. I have very many. Can you tell I'm making up for my, my being late? It's like, let me give you all the information now. <laughs> no, we love it, Mars. We love it, Mars. Um, but yeah, for, I, I, I don't think I've mentioned before, Mars. But yeah, Positive East is an organisation that works predominantly supporting people with um, and live and affected by HIV. Um, and mm. our lovely Rebecca here works for an organisation. Um, um, so I had a question for you, Rebecca. So when it comes to the women that you work with, do you how do you feel like their maternity pathway or their maternity journey differs um, compared to those who are not living with HIV, for example? Well, what I think is in terms of the practicalities, so, you know, going through their antenatal screening and whatever else, that perhaps is very similar to a woman not living with HIV. Where the differences come, obviously, is whether they are found to be diagnosed um, during antenatal, then there's that whole conversation about, listen, we have to talk about the fact that we've um, your HIV test has come back positive. Then there are uh, issues with treatment. So if someone's not on treatment, they then need to be put on treatment to make sure that their viral load is undetectable by the time they are ready to deliver. If they are already, and we have a number of women that are already having their second, third child, while well, they're, you know, already living with HIV, um, it's making sure that the treatment that they're on, uh, which is very often um, 
you know, already in place anyway, their viral load is undetectable so that the chances of passing on the virus to the baby are very, very, um, you know, are drastically reduced. And, and that works really, really well. I think then you've got after delivery, there are issues around breastfeeding. And now we've gotten to a point where uh, women can breastfeed if they're supported um, to do so safely. Now, this is where the challenge comes in. And a lot of women feel, feel they're not being heard. You, mm. you will get women that say, I would love to breastfeed, but they're, you know, based on the guidelines that are there at the moment. Or no. And this is, again, where we say information is really key, knowing your choices, knowing what it is you'd like, listening to your body, and then being able to negotiate that, you know, building your confidence mm. or having somebody there so that you can negotiate that. Um, and it's not that they can't, it's, you know, well, no, you, you know, because that's what the guidelines say, mm. no, it's not, it's not an option. It is if they're supported to do so safely. Mm. And that's what we need to be informing the women. The other thing that makes it slightly more difficult or different for women living with HIV is the stigma. It's the yeah. stigma within the healthcare professional settings, it's a stigma within families, um, you know, everything else. Why are you breastfeeding? I mean, we've moved on quite a lot, but there were times within, you know, the HIV journey where people were told, but you're HIV positive, you cannot have babies. Some mm. people were, you know, well, what do you call it when they're, it's not a hysterectomy, is it a hysterectomy? Forgive me. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in some countries, unwilling. Yeah. They're sterilized. They're told you cannot have children. And that's where the challenge comes in. I mean, we've moved on so far now. Come on, women are able to have vaginal births, which we were not able to do very many years ago. So, you know, that's where the, the difference lies. Um, uh, yeah. when, when you mentioned the, the lack of education sometimes in, in, um, in health services, it scares me. It, sometimes the mind boggles. I went to have um, a blood test a few weeks ago and I had a top that said, um, you know those chlamydia tops, it said something, no, say no to syphilis or long time no see syphilis, one of those tops that we've got. And somebody asked me what I did and I spoke and I mentioned I worked in HIV. And this is a phlebotomist who works routinely in HIV, you know, in, in blood. So when I spoke a bit about the work that I did, and he said, oh, AIDS, is it still killing people? And he, he just, he spurted out some of the most bizarre things and I just thought, this is somebody who takes blood, who tests regularly, and who's not up to date with information about HIV, which is scary. And if I'm mm -hmm. seeing in the you know in the phlebotomist at the you know at the local GP, what are people seeing in in maternity services? I had a service user once who, when she disclosed her HIV status to the midwife, they doubled up their gloves. They put infection control on the door. They did all of these. <laughs> they did all of these bizarre things, even though that person was undetectable and they had, you know, there was nothing to worry about. But mm -hmm. it was, I mean, and, and things like double gloving, those are universal precautions anyway. You know, you shouldn't have to do it for a person living with HIV or, you know, it, it's stuff that you're meant to be doing routinely. Not double gloving, but yeah, routinely you're meant to do those, take those precautions. Mm -hmm. But that's, precisely again that has an impact on on encouraging people to come forward to test is precisely because of mm. these kinds of stories that people hear mm. oh I was given the last appointment or you know I've it, everything is, is sort of cleansed and and you know disinfected because I drank from the cup no it's, it's a whole load of myths that we need to um, get the general public informed about, but yeah, it's even, even more frustrating that even within the healthcare professional um, sort of settings, it's still really rife. It's, it's actually yeah. quite disturbing. And I feel, sorry for coming in, Rebecca, but I feel like it's even more, that's why I said to you that how, as a standard, every trust should have like HIV midwife. Why? Because there's a clear care plan Yes, midwives are midwives, but not like, to be honest, not every midwife has the understanding of every area uh, of um, conditions from coming with. But there has to be a basic <laughs> knowledge there. But clear care plan, clear understanding for that woman, what this now means for her being pregnant with this mm. condition. 
mm -hmm. um, and things of guidance that comes into, I think antenatally, if she's given education, she can advocate for herself. Also, in during pregnancy, she can advocate in labor, she can just clear. I've had many women come with this, they come and clear, clear, you really, you know what to do for her. You know what to do after. How do you bath the baby? Do you, do you, you know, all these long things. And sometimes, because people, it, it is, some people have, if they're not aware, like I said, your education leads to fear in some people and leads mm -hmm. them to miss this service through their, mm -hmm. their So I feel like how this is why these women deserve people to un have understanding, because otherwise, a left of a woman having to educate herself on men, you know, with certain things, you don't know what she'll be doing here. And, you know, and like I said, you said as well, Rebecca, people don't come forward and tell you, or they come in late, they turn up to the hospital, I've had many cases, and then they, we test it just there and then. You know, and, and they didn't tell you they had HIV, you know, this is so many different cases and, and then they've had a miscare, you know, and postpartum, the stigma stays on with them, especially when they've been treated badly because of it. They've got the status now, the stigma continues them, especially with a lack of education within the people there. Well, it goes with the societal narrative, doesn't it? Yeah, right, right. Black, black men are feckless, are feckless pregnant, impregnate everyone and move on. Yeah. Black women just keep dropping babies like it's good. So we're just feckened. That all is legacy of enslavement and the way that they decided to make it so that they could do the things that they did to us. Mm -hmm. But these are the things that carry on into societal narrative. Mm -hmm. And if as a black woman you present and you say, you know, HIV positive, you know that the first thought is, so how many people have you been sleeping with to get there? What terrible, disgusting things did you do to get there? When it comes to breastfeeding, I've got two wonderful doulas that I trained who run a whole work, uh, a whole day on breastfeeding with HIV and how someone with HIV can breastfeed for six months exclusively. It doesn't need anything else. There's no reason why, as long as that baby is exclusively breastfed, then the, the parent with HIV can breast and chest feed that baby. And I just say, that, that is not, not a lot of, like, before I became a midwife, I was a breastfeeding peer support worker for a few years so my background was always breastfeeding before I came to midwifery and the amount of midwives that do not know that oh it's it's scary shocking. and I obviously work in a London trust and where I, I you know we have all the hospital that I'm at we do have um a lady um a midwife who specializes in HIV um however it's scary I don't live in London and I've come where I am it's scary if I was to think of getting a job up here and the perceptions that they would have of me as a black woman, as a black healthcare professional, mm. possibly what they think of other service users and clients coming into the hospital that are black. Um, and, you know, what the care would be like for a person that came and said, yeah, I'm HIV positive and I'm a black woman. Like what provisions would we have for them? Not in a, if London Trust isn't getting it hundred percent and they're still lacking to come out um, you know, where it's predominantly Caucasians, um, mm. it, it, it is, it's, it's a little bit scary, a little bit worrying. I mean, it's it, happens, it happens already that, you know, people that we know or that we're supporting living outside of London are having so many challenges in that area because, yeah, information is, is old uh, or outdated and they have absolutely no idea. So yeah, it does does beg the question if the London Trusts are having um, a little bit of trouble. But see, my belief is even if you don't have a specialist midwife, the the issue we you know the 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 conversation we had about having continuity before, if you have one midwife who understands what your needs are, even if she's not aware, and I think as any healthcare professional, it is up to you really. So okay, this is not something I'm familiar with can let me find out a bit more let me work with you where is it you know what can we do to make your experience better you don't then just say oh no I'm not doing this or that is not professionalism as far as I'm concerned you know do the job that you're supposed to be doing if you're not aware of it inform yourself try mm. and get more information that's what your role is to support the person in front of you if you don't have that information try and seek it out in you know you know, from somewhere where it'll help that person. So, yes. What's scary is in um, a lot of trusts, because I run cultural competency training, people say, well, only 3%, only 2%, only 1% of the population are black and brown bodied. And so we asked them, okay, what does that mean 
in numbers, not in percentages, in numbers. So are you talking three people, 300 people, 3,000 people, 30,000 people? How many people is it acceptable to die because you don't need to pay attention to them because they are only 3% of a population? And when you get when you say it to people like that, they suddenly go, oh, because actually it's not acceptable that anyone yeah. dies because they have extra levels of melanin in their skin because they're perceived as black bodied. And the societal narrative says, well, they're not worth much. So we don't have to worry about them because we've got 97% of the people. So there's no point in getting educated on how to do midwife means with woman. Doctors were originally known as male midwives with women, right? As we go through history and we come up, you have one job, love people and walk with them through their journey. You're not supposed to sort of traumatize them and re-traumatize them again. And if you want to talk about learning, what needs to be learned is black women don't present with predispositions because they're pregnant until recently the safest place to be a black woman was in your bed at home before you start to deal with the microaggressions of the day our sympathetic system is absolutely darling you tell them our sympathetic system is overloaded with stress and adrenaline and cortisol even when we're smiling and laughing and nothing bad has happened to us all day all week all month or year you know, so if we start to look at the way society mistreats black body people, of course they're going to present with predispositions. It's not that white women don't have obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac issues. It's not that black women have them because they're black, because we're the global majority, not the global minority. And if our bodies were as awful at giving birth as people say, then we would be the minority. And when it comes to HIV and the stigma that people have about HIV already, and then you add a layer of blackness, of course we're in trouble. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I'm just looking at the time and I've been so engrossed in this conversation, I did not realize so before we close i'm going to go around to everyone and i've got three questions to ask just before we leave um we've spoken about advocacy quite a few times um so can you give any ways black women can advocate for themselves can you mention any positive initiatives in the community and where can we find you moving forward is there anything you'd like to plug is there anything you'd like us to check out uh, can we start with Nichelle? I know you're, you've got your hands full there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of um, advocating for yourself, it's just getting a really supportive birth partner, be that uh, your mum, um, your partner. Sometimes I sometimes find that sometimes, it's, oh, sorry, sometimes it's nice to have someone that's not your mum or birth partner. Some people feel more comfortable. It's got to be someone that you're comfortable with. It's got to be someone that is going to put your and communicate your wishes um without um when you're predisposed and in your zone um so yeah definitely get someone that can advocate for you make sure they know i know some people are a bit funny about birth plans as well i hear it all the time they're put as negatives a uh, birth preferences make sure you you have an idea of how you'd like your birth to go i know some people think they're not worth the paper that they're written on but they're really really important i think mm -hmm. it's really really important for me to physically see especially if you're coming into me and i've never met you before I don't want to come and keep disturbing you and disturbing your zone. So it's really good for me to see what you want from your delivery and what your preferences are. And I will try, we'll try and facilitate that as much as possible. Um, and yeah, so that's my advocating for yourself during birth. I'm sure everyone else will have stuff for antenatal and postnatal. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> um, I mean, Nisha's has pretty much covered everything, but um, I would like to sort of say to people, everyone, it's not up to black women to take the time. Um, that's one thing. It's it's not our responsibility to shoulder everything. 
we have help, let's use it. And the other thing is, you know, be informed, read what you can, ask the questions that you need to know the answers to, just really keep yourself informed because that will, in, will allow you to make informed choices. That will allow you to gain the confidence to negotiate with those. You know, so for me, those are the key things that I, I, would, I would say. No, thank you. And is there anything you'd like to plug? Where can we find you if you want to, if there's any, you know, <coughs> HIV and there women or pregnant people, you know, living with HIV and they'd like to contact you? Um, yeah, so we have our website, which is in the chat. It's for triple uh, My name is Rebecca. Uh, yeah, please reach out, even if it's just questions, you know, about conception or, or during pregnancy or post-pregnancy yeah, just reach out and we'll see we'd love to have a chat with you thank you and mars we also had so on top of those other questions we did have <laughs> in the facebook that i've been um that i've been trying to uh, get in and somebody asked do all expect and expecting um, mothers or people get offered no. doula services no doulas are uh, private individuals the nhs has had a couple of um sort of attempts at bringing in doulas but the doulas that have worked in hospitals have ended up becoming auxiliary staff and not doing what they're there for if you're employed by the nhs if you're employed by the trust then you have to follow the trust guidelines and what the trust says and you're no longer independent to um to do the work that you're doing mm -hmm. Thank you. And so the other question was, how can uh, black women advocate for themselves? Are there any positive initiatives in the community that you'd like to mention? And where can we find you? I've, I found you quite easy, actually. When I was <laughs> That's because my mouth is big and I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so advocacy. So exactly as Nish said. And honestly, I don't know why people get upset with um, birth plans. You plan to go on a picnic. It rains. You change the plan. I mean, hello. Also, when I encourage people to make plans, make three plans, but all on one sheet. Plan A, how is it that you ideally want to birth? Plan B, what do you do when things don't go according to plan? Plan C, how do you want your cesarean to run? Really easy, all three. Biased, get a doula. Doulas, the prices go um, sort of across a huge range of budgets. There's neighborhood doulas who are a charity that help people that can't afford doulas to get to this. But if you can buy yourself that top-notch pram that's gonna last you three to six months, seriously, get yourself, a, spend the money on a doula who's with you throughout your pregnancy, the birth and post-birth. Positive initiatives. Well, so I run a, a once a month online space for black and brown bodied people called Birthing in Colour, along with two others, Tando and Kayla. And we just, every month, we just talk about different things within the perinatal period from conception right through post the postpartum. So that's a wonderful thing to look after. Black Mama Village, which is um, started by Lorna Phillip, who is Birmingham doula, is another initiative where you can get people together, where we educate ourselves because we already know the solutions come from us, not from outside. Where can you find me? Well, you can Google my name, Mars Lord, or you can find me at Abuela, which is Spanish for grandmother, Abuela Doula. And I chose the name Abuela because I believe in bringing the wisdom of the grandmothers into modern day birth, because we've lost the traditions and the cultures of our heritage in order to fit into the white patriarchal society. And then we wonder why we have problems when we're trying to be ourselves and raise and have our families so google mars lord look at me up at marslord.co.uk or abueladoulas.com thank you um I, I i did also listen to you on i think it was radio 4 yes. and then i also tuned in and saw your lovely face on um was it panorama uh, dispatches the black maternity scandal mm -hmm. yeah so, no i was really excited so i saw those after um somebody recommended you to, to to talk on our panel and thank you very much um and last i'm on lots of podcasts everywhere so you can find me beautiful we'll keep looking <laughs> thanks and last but not least kemi 
Um, I think everyone said it all. Um, so definitely, I agree with the birth preferences. Um, it's good to just be able to know what you want. Um, but like I said to people that how if you're even planning a pregnancy, start to educate yourself on what pregnancy looks like. Um, Labour, what it looks like. Know what your options are. Um, ask, begin to write questions down whenever you have a challenge. Not challenge, I say question. I don't say it shouldn't be a battle. Don't go in with a head. And I think even though you hear certain things, don't go in with a head. I'm going to argue over it. But go in there with the fact that how I, if I have questions, I will ask them. And also starting to believe that you can say no to things and you have a right to challenge, say, I don't want to do something. But having the right education, you can do that rightly if you know what to expect and the education behind it. Um, having someone that advocates for you, investing in service, I think is very important as well. And um, I do think that our white counterparts do really invest in themselves when they're on that journey of pregnancy. We as a black community, I know not everyone can afford it, but I think it's important to invest in certain services for yourself in the postpartum period as well. Because one of the things mm -hmm. that did cause maternal deaths was the perinatal period in terms of mental health. So having peer support that can look like your friends, family, but it can also look like other mothers that have gone through certain things you've gone through. And there's a lot of um, black um, parents out there really. um, 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 pride, lots of different things online as well that have these services just to have peer support that talk through what you're going through. Um, I offer um, lots of postpartum services myself within professional auntie and midwife, but based on my own experiences, I understand the importance of continuity of care and having that extra person that understands what you're going through and I think it's very important so that's what I would say as positive initiatives there's lots out there um if you want to find myself I'm at professional auntie www.professionalauntie.co.uk and I'm also accessible by email and Facebook professional auntie very, very much Kemi um so yeah I think there was one thing that was sent through to me um and if you are living with HIV and you're going through the menopause there a new series of creative writing workshops um, and it runs every Thursday um, between seven and half eight via Zoom. Um, I'm going to put the email contact in the or Alex will put the email contact in the box and it's um, sec, secon at nas.org.uk um, so I'll put that in the in the box if anybody is going through the menopause and would like to join a series of creating writing workshops but thank you so 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 much i've had um i've learned a lot in this discussion i'm sure the people watching have learned a lot as well um we've had a lot of different you know we've laughed we've felt a bit sad we've gone through the whole range of emotions here but this was a very very wonderful open and honest conversation and i appreciate all of you taking your time out on a saturday to come and have the discussion with us and thank you very much everyone so until next time Thank you for tuning in to Be Live and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Pleasure.